In murder, justice can only be found in the Voices of True Crime podcast. Fridays at 3 p.m. on AM 880-KIXI in Seattle. Thursdays at 3.30 on Alternative Talk 1150 KKNW Seattle. Now, for your host, Joe Goldberg. Well, today we're going to be talking about a book. Uh, coming out on the 30th of July, and it's called The Lewiston Shootings, an All-American Tragedy, and we've got the writer of that book with us. That's Robert Conlon. So thank you for being here, Robert. Thank you for having me, guys. I appreciate it. Now, so, Robert, now, first of all, before we get into the scenario of this, of what happened here in the book and all that, what made you write this book? Well, I live here in the state about an hour from uh, from where the shootings took place and I actually bowled in that bowling alley where they where they took place. I have a background as a journalist and I I knew the story was going to be told and I thought well if somebody's going to tell it then maybe it should be me, you know, who has a sense of place and and the people and so that was the main motivation was being here and and having it feel somewhat personal. It affected everybody in the state even though it was confined to Lewiston. Okay, so let's talk about this. So the premise of the book and what happened, uh, what's the basic details of October 25th, mm, to right. 2023? Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Robert Carr II, a 40-year-old truck driver from a small town right near Lewiston, in Bowdoin, was in the midst of a psychotic break that lasted about a year or so, and uh, he went from fairly normal to unrecognizable to just about everybody who knew him. And uh, he set forth on that evening, convinced that everybody, virtually everybody, was calling him a pedophile, obsessed with that idea. Uh, it started out with just strangers, and then it morphed into his family, and then eventually his only son. And he uh, he got in this car, he, he equipped himself with a Ruger AR-10, and, and he had an AR-15 as well, and hundreds of rounds of ammunition, and uh, tactical thermal scope, and he uh, drove about 15 miles to Lewiston uh, in the evening and went into the bowling alley where he had, it was called Just in Time, where he had bowled before on a number of occasions. And he went in and he opened fire and he shot and killed eight innocent people. There were 18 children inside the bowling alley. Thankfully, none of them were killed. I'm sorry, a 14-year-old, so you I guess we'll call him a child. But he killed eight people there and wounded uh, several more. And then he, he left the bowling alley and he got his car and he drove four miles to a sports bar called Schmingis, and he had also been there, and he had participated in uh, cornhole tournaments, and he opened fire there and shot and killed 10 people and wounded several more, and so that was 18 people he killed in total, and then he got in his car, and he drove a few miles away, about 10 miles to a distant location. Uh, As it turns out, he had the whole thing planned out, and he parked his car in a at a, at a boat launch, and then he proceeded to go to his final destination. And we, we can talk about that as as, as we progress, because that's where he was found there a couple of days later. So, and this happened where? Like in Lewiston, you said. So what what do, what can you tell us about that town? Yeah, Lewiston is uh, it's in central Maine. It's, uh, I think, the third largest city, which in proportion to anywhere else is really small, but it's 30 Seven thousand people. Uh, it's a it's a real working class city, a real mill city back in you know back in the day. It's on the Androscoggin River and has gigantic old textile mills. Uh, and it's gone through some rough times. And the city has you know rebounded somewhat, but it's also experiencing some real heavy crime and fentanyl abuse and, and related crime these days. But you know, so in terms of in terms of crime in Maine, it's you know it's one of the more crime ridden places, but uh, in perspective, you know, to somewhere else. But, the, you know, nobody had expected a mass shooting of this kind in the state. That was one of the big the big takeaways was, you know, everybody was surprised by the scope of it. Well, I think I think even if it happens in a more populated place, or I, I still wouldn't expect a mass shooting to happen anywhere I've been, even though it happens. You know what I'm saying? It's still going to be a shock, even though, even though there's quite a few of them. Yeah. Well, just to put it in perspective, I mean, the state of Maine had 18 homicides. And I think, uh, sorry, so, uh, 18 homicides the year before. So they had 18 in one night. Hey, Bob, you, you mentioned in your description how it, he broke down over the course of a year. You know, why? Why didn't people notice? Well, they did notice. There was no shortage of anybody noticing. Um, yeah, it was over the course of a year. He started out, um, his family obviously noticed first. 
um, that he was becoming angry and more aggressive and he was drinking more. He wasn't much of a drinker before, but it, you know, morphed into he started saying that strangers were calling him a pedophile. He was out in public, say, at Home Depot or in a restaurant, and he would say, see, they're here, you know, they're, they're talking about me. And whoever was with him would say, no, you're crazy. It's not happening. Nobody's saying anything about you. Uh, he had just got some new hearing aids uh, that he got over the counter. He was having a hard time adjusting those. So oftentimes he would shut them off because he had progressive hearing loss. I think that led to the sense of isolation and paranoia. But ultimately, I think... Um, you know, they found out later that he had severe traumatic brain injury. And, you know, we could talk about that and what the cause of that might have been. But he just he just got worse and worse. And the family was desperate to try to get him some help. Uh, he was uh, he had an 18 year old son and was divorced, but he was close to his family, his farming family from the small town. And they, you know, they, they tried. They, they contacted the sheriff's office and. You know, he's he's really a, a, a concern to us. We're all concerned about him. He has a lot of firearms. He's starting to, you know, starting to really see, talk about this all the time, become obsessed with this idea. And he's getting very angry, and we're concerned, and we'd like you to do something. And uh, this first happened in May of 23. The local sheriff's office in Sagatahawk County responded and there wasn't much they they could do, you know. To give credit to the to the sheriff's department, then they that that particular deputy went out of his way to be proactive to try to find a way to. And he talked to his army reserve unit, and he was a, uh, a member, twenty year member of the army reserve NCO. And so he was very proactive. He he was very concerned, and and he did what he could. But there wasn't a whole lot to do at that point because you know it didn't rise to the level of of a threat to somebody. And that would change over the course of the summer. So in essence, you're saying that he was started sort of having these mental problems, break breakdowns, and nothing was being done by anybody. I mean, the family was trying to reach out. Yeah. Did they go to doc? doctors or anybody like that or was there a psychiatrist involved or a clinic ultimately in july uh he went to the so they had two-week training for the army reserve this particular unit was a training unit so they trained cadets at west point and they did that every summer most of the time he he was involved with with training on grenades throwing a lot of grenades this that particular time last year he was supposed to help train on machine guns but they were aware of some of his, his deteriorating mental health he still they still allowed him to go the army reserve but while he was there he had a meltdown and which resulted in them uh it resulted in, they called the new york state police to the barracks because it was a, a national guard camp and so new york state police had jurisdiction and then the reserve officers command directed him to a psychiatric hospital uh where he spent 19 days and so it, you know by the by that point by july you know it was it was now a known fact that he was getting worse and worse but i think the fact that he went to the hospital made some people think okay now he's on the right track and he's going to get better but as it turns out he had no intention of getting better he he was telling a friend of his that he was speaking to from the hospital that he was going to lie to them to get us, you know, to tell them what they wanted to hear to get out, uh, which ultimately he did. And they let him out. Nobody knows why, because they haven't explained it, but he had told them that he had a hit list. They knew about his paranoia, and they knew about his obsession with this pedophilia, and they knew about his firearms. They knew that uh, the army psychiatrist who first saw him suggested or strongly urged that he not have any access to weapons. Uh, and despite that, he was released in, in August and came right back to, to Maine. And the first thing he did, actually, when he came back was to try to buy a suppressor. But he was denied the ability to do that because he had to check off, a, he had to fill out the form. That, believe it or not, suppressors can be harder to buy than, than guns. So he had to fill out a form, and he, and, and he answered honestly when they asked whether he had been adjudicated in a mental facility. So he was denied the access to that suppressor. I don't know if he intended to use it or not. It seemed like at that point he was actively planning to do what he did. But, of course, nobody knew that at the time. But clearly he was deteriorating. At that point, there were so many opportunities to uh, to intervene. The, the Army Reserve is limited in terms of how much they could do because they only have jurisdiction over him when he's on active duty with the Army Reserve. So that's usually about 38 days a year. Otherwise, you know, they they can't force him into mental health treatment, and they cannot take away his personal weapons. But they could coordinate with local law enforcement, and they didn't. They chose not to do that until the very end. Well, you, you say that he's, he was planning over time. Yeah, I am no expert. 
Planning is one thing. Jumping to shooting and killing 18 people and wounding 13 others seems to be a pretty big step. Maybe it wasn't. Maybe it just deteriorated to the point where he had, that was just the next thing to do. But, but was there? Was there something that made the jump, or was that what happened? Well, it, you know, it's impossible to say with any clarity, but I think, you know, just based on the evidence, um, when the police showed up at, at the, uh, the the base in, in New York in July, and ultimately we saw the video, the, the video camera from the New York State troopers was, you know, he told them, this is what's happening, everybody's calling me a pedophile, and then he said um, something really ominous that up until that point they had been very uh, conciliatory with him, but then he said, uh, these guys are, you know, they know what I'm capable of, and they know what I can do. You know, the, the troopers were alarmed by that. You could tell from their reaction, but they didn't, it didn't rise to the level where they thought they had to take his weapons away. Keep in mind, this is another state, and they have different laws. And So there were three really jurisdictions. It was Maine, and there was uh, the Army, and, the, and, and then there was New York. So, you know, it made it complicated. It seemed at that point, and his, his best friend who knew him for 18 years and was the last person that he had any contact with. You know, I spoke to him at length, and he told me that, you know, in retrospect, he could tell that he was planning to do what he did. And he, operationally, he planned to go to the bowling alley, and then he planned to go to the sports bar, and then he planned to go ultimately to the site where they found his body, where he used to work. And he planned to shoot all of them, too, which is not something the Maine State Police has admitted. And I'll tell you why a little bit later. But So he had a plan. It's, it's clear that he... He, you know, he parked his car in a place that he could access to his next destination, and he wasn't found for another 46 hours. So, sitting there waiting to uh, execute his plan, it just didn't. It didn't happen only because there was a lockdown, and and those employees didn't come to work, or he would have killed a lot more people. Uh, now that it's happened, and then they find his body, what what goes on? What do the police do? And what's what's the follow up? Did they? Did they figure out what went on? Did they? Let's talk about the after effects. Yeah, man, that's a tough one. Well, so the Maine State Police was the the, the main agency in charge in, in the state of Maine. They they handle all homicide investigations outside of Portland and Bangor, the two largest cities. Over the course of that manhunt, from the time they found his car until the time they found his body was about forty six hours. Um, there were some eight hundred law enforcement here in the state. You know, in that in that region, just helicopters and patrol boats on the river and, uh, you know, SWAT teams and armored cars. And it was crazy. I mean, the, they were shut down, locked down all over the place. You know, people were in just in fear. It was, it was, not only was it the shooting that was traumatic, but it was, uh, you know, he could have been, he, he could have been on the run anywhere. I think at some point as it went on, people thought, well, he's disappeared into the woods. He's trained. He, you know, he's a, an outdoorsman and a, you know, he's a, a trained, uh, Armed army guys, so he's gonna he's gonna be gone for a long time. But as it turns out, they found him a, a mile away from where he parked his car. And the thing that they do not discuss and have not discussed, and once again, you know, to criticize the police is easy and to play armchair quarterback. It was a huge investigation, something they way bigger in scale than anything they had ever done before. And so they, you know, it was chaotic. But in the midst of all that chaos, his brother. Ryan, Ryan Carr, this Robert Carr's brother, who was a, a ranger, a U.S. ranger who did four tours in Iraq and Afghanistan, he told them about six hours later after they found his, after the shootings, and, uh, when they interviewed him, he said, I think my brother is going to go to Maine Recycling where he used to work because he, he hates those people. And, and then his best friend told the, the law enforcement the same thing. I think that he's going to go to Maine Recycling and he's going to shoot them. Because he, he can't stand that. He thinks that the origin story about him being a pedophile started there at that place while he quit there. And I, I'll, I'll give you a little background on that in a second. But they, they were told that in the, in the chaos. They were following all kinds of leads. That, you know, there were tip line, 800 or 1,000 tips on a dedicated tip line. And they were chasing all those, but they weren't chasing the ones that made the most sense, which was uh, he parked his car here at the boat launch, and then there was a path that went through the woods along the river and came out right behind uh, the facility where he used to work, where he had a lot of animosity towards people, and ultimately where they found his body in a trailer in the parking lot. So, you know, he could have easily have killed more people, and it certainly would have cut down the amount of, the, you know, the, the extent of the manhunt if they had followed the breadcrumbs, but they, they didn't do that. So at this point, um, what happens 
around him, like his family, uh, friends, and stuff like that? Um, how do they handle this, and do they start taking the blame or start getting accused? Yeah, I mean, I think the fa- the families. I spoke to the ex wife and his sister at length, and um, you know they're devastated. I mean, they you know they have a tremendous sense of, of guilt and. And, you know, but I think ultimately at the end of the day, the, the fact is that the, uh, there was a commission that was formed by the governor to look into it. It consists of some high-level, you know, judicial and law enforcement here in the state. And they interim report determined that the sheriff's office, when they responded to the – there was a call in, in September, and this is kind of chilling, um, but in September his best friend was with him. And once again, the last person who really had any contact with him and – they went to a casino, and on the way back, uh, Robert Card accused his best friend of participating in this campaign uh, to belittle him, and he punched him in the face while they were driving. His friend got out of the vehicle, and, and then he immediately texted his, his superior in the in the Army unit, and he said, ultimately, he said, I'm afraid that he's going to snap into a mass shooting. That was his exact words. That Army commanding officer then contacted the Sagadaha County Sheriff, on this was in September, middle of September, and asked them to do a welfare check. And the second hot sheriff sent out 25-year deputy to do the welfare check. He knocked on the door. And he was fully aware now at this point that, you know, that he was in the middle of a psychosis, had been in a hospital, possessed a lot of firearms, was, you know, was getting worse and worse. He heard him moving around in his trailer, so he, he backed off, which he couldn't go in, uh, main Main law did not allow him to enter without a warrant. To you, know, you could not get a warrant to do protective custody under under the main law. So he backed off and didn't want to force any issue. And he just said, "Okay, I'm going to regroup." And and you can understand that. You know, man, that's a very dangerous position to be in. He was by himself. Ultimately, he had back backup. But but then he chose to instead of you know formulating another plan, he he uh, contacted the family was assured by the brother that they would try to get the firearms away from, from Robert. And then he just basically left it at that, and he went on vacation the next day and closed the case. When he came back from vacation 10 days later, nobody had done any follow-up at all. Nobody checked to see if, if you know, he still had his weapons. Nobody checked to see if he was worse. Nobody checked to see if there was any harm done to him or other people. He came back from vacation, and, and then he lifted the bolo. So he erased the file six that was... You know, was an alert to other police to watch out for him without checking to see if anything had resolved at all. He just and he, and he essentially closed the case without without anything happening. Um, and I, I think that's the part that really is a lot of people upset here in the state that that he did that. And then you know the, the sheriff's office has refused to accept any responsibility. In fact, that particular deputy then announced he was going to run for sheriff because I thought I guess he thinks he's so well qualified to do that which is pretty arrogant, but he did, and he is in November. He's running for sheriff. So, you know, it's it's hard to understand how how he could have just wiped his hands clean of that without without doing something. Well, it seems like a big moment in the uh, red flag, red crumb oh, yeah. path that, led, that leads to this. But if he could have gone back, was there that one thing that someone should have done to say, we've got to stop this, you know? Could somebody like Lacamole take away his guns? That was there one thing, or would it have had to have been a series of several things to make this not happen? You know, they could have. They didn't have to go into his trailer to, to take him into protective custody. They they could have waited until he came out. They could have gone to his workplace. They could have formulated a plan right then, because they, at that point they understood how. You know, you can listen to some tapes where that particular deputy is telling people, "Oh yeah, he's definitely in a really bad way. He's got a lot of weapons, and he's." He's just came out of a psychiatric hospital. He seems to be getting worse. And, you know, so he was aware of that was the opportunity that really presented itself. But there were also opportunities for the, you know, in his army unit, there were, there were multiple law enforcement officials, including a, a deputy, a, a sheriff from the neighboring county who witnessed him, personally witnessed his meltdown in, in New York. Uh, and so he, he knew how much of a danger he was. So not only was he an army, uh, NCO, but he was a, a sheriff, you know, of a county. So, you know, to, to think that they wouldn't have been alerted enough to the dangers. They've all been well trained on, on how to recognize these things. And, and so there were opportunities for a long time, for months, I think, for somebody to do something to formulate a plan between the army and law enforcement, local law enforcement, uh, multiple opportunities. And they just, 
you know, one after another. They were sort of just ignored, and that and the ticking time bomb just kept ticking. Ultimately, you know, he exploded. It's as simple as that. I mean, you know, his his own friend was saying he's going to do a mass shooting. I'm afraid he's going to do a mass shooting. So, you know, they had they had that. Well, why do you think that, that people don't act on this sort of suspicion or when they see something? And they're trained, like, like you said, like, yeah. for instance, that one guy. So when they have experience and they kind of understand it better than, let's say, a common yeah. Joe citizen yeah. out there. So why don't they actually act? Why does nothing happen? I, you know, man, I wish I knew. <laughs> I mean, I, you know, I, I don't know. I, 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 cer- I, I certainly play devil's advocate. I try to put myself in the in the shoes i you know i don't want to point fingers say somebody just completely failed but it's just hard to understand i mean this is your job public safety is your job and this has happened in multiple mass shooting cases it happened in sutherland springs and the air force didn't flag that guy multiple times uh it happened in buffalo when that kid was sending up red flags left and right on you know right on social media uh, it happened in Dillon Roof in South Carolina. He was he was letting everybody know what he was going to do. It's not like it's a it's a rare occasion. It's, it, uh, there definitely seems to be in this case. I know I, I certainly recognize it. it was a territorial. You know I can't tell this guy because he's in this county and they deal with it this way. So I I, I remember one of the army guys said I I knew I couldn't call Sagadaw County and say I suggest this because they'd be like well piss off this is you know this isn't your responsibility this is our territory. So there seems to be some of that going on. How do you approach a state which is in trauma and the families and friends and the people who have dealt with this? How do you deal with this highly emotional topic when you're trying to write a book about something which is really fresh? Yeah, wow, you know, that's a good question. That was the hardest part. You know, I knew it I knew it going in it would be the hardest part and it it definitely it definitely was the hardest part. It's emotions are so raw. These are I mean, these are eighteen people who just set out to have fun one night and they didn't come home. A lot of kids were left behind. Four of the victims were deaf. And they were in a participating in a deaf cornhole league. Uh, they were very close knit the deaf community. I ultimately I talked to his wife through an interpreter for uh, interviewed her at a local library and it just was you know it was hard not to cry. You know, it's four young kids. And so approaching it is you just have to be human. You know, you're a human being and they're a human being. And they suffered a horrible loss. And I, I, I'm i not that guy that can just, I'm not a daily news reporter that can call up and just hound somebody to death. I, you know, I, I worked hard at trying to cultivate relationships with people. I live here. You know, that was part of it was just always recognizing that this is another human being who's really suffering right now and respect that. And if they don't want to talk, they don't want to talk. It's it's so overwhelming when you first you're looking at the, you know the photos of 18 individuals, and you just it just you know when you delve into it. And I I took six or seven months to write the book, and I I got a real sense of you know these their their life stories. I didn't obviously I didn't talk to all the families, but just read as much as I could about them. And you know it's it was 18 individual murders. Yeah, it was it was pretty overwhelming. Here's the thing I haven't mentioned was that, and this is tragic is that he was obsessed with being called a pedophile. And the reason why he went to Maine Recycling, and I, I just know this from knowing enough about the kid and talking to his friend and just and just surmising what, what happened with, and his sister, was that he worked at Maine Recycling where they found his body. And that was the first place that, that he mentioned that people were calling him a pedophile. And his friend who worked with him uh, said, no, nobody's calling you a pedophile. But then I guess... He overheard uh, some reference to Robert Card being on the Maine Sex Offender Registry. He didn't do anything about it, but Robert Card's sister did. She went on the Maine Sex Offender Registry, and she wanted to look into this and find out whether her brother was, you know, was on it, or why were people saying that he was on it. And she went on and she put his name into the search bar, but he's Robert Card the Second, and she must have typed in Robert Card the Second, and it didn't come up. Uh, as it turns out, there is a Robert Card on the sex offender registry in, in Maine. And that's not a common name, by the way. It's, and not only that, but the, they share very similar birthdays, like 4483 and 4384, something very close to each other. And so I think what happened was the origin story started at Maine Recycling. And, and so I asked myself, well, why would they be saying that at Maine Recycling? And then I looked into the database on the, on the registry and there, at least 12 of those employees there were on the were on the registry themselves. I think what happened was that they he overheard them. He, he had new hearing aids, by the way, which were causing him a huge amount of difficulty. Uh, these new Bluetooth-enabled hearing aids, and he couldn't get the the volume right, so he kept shutting them off. And then he would turn them up, and then he could overhear conversations like Superman from far distances. And that's that's actually 
you know, was thrown into this toxic stew was he, he claimed that he could hear people, you know, 500 yards away calling him. Ultimately, he went haywire with that story in his head. But I think it started there. And so there's no doubt in my mind that he went back there. Um, and that really was his, you know, his intent was to kill his co-workers. And, and, and the fact that there was a Robert card on the registry is just a tragic, you know, a tragic circumstance. Well, that was sort of my next question. Which is, did anything significant or any, anything at all come out of this as a, as a positive? Were there laws, whether it be law, whether it be change of the system? Yeah, I can tell you that, I mean, one positive in the Card family is very, they find some solace in this fact because uh, the family is an extraordinary family. And I, I, I feel for them so much because they have not only grief about their brother, but just remorse and guilt and all that stuff. And they, you know, so... They're remarkable people, the sister. So they, they're working actively now to try to uh, help deal with the mental health issues with veterans. And uh, there's no doubt there was a, his brain was studied by Boston University's traumatic brain injury unit, national, you know, nationally recognized leader in the field of studying this. And they, and they found significant traumatic brain injury. So most assuredly, associated with his training in the army throwing grenades so as a result there's been some changes there was a, a bipartisan bill that was passed that it was called the national blast over pressure act uh, which is mandating that all the armed forces new recruits now and all the four armed forces are have to be tested cognitively before they when they come in and then tracked uh, during their stay and afterwards so that they can have a baseline assessment for you know, do they have any traumatic brain injury? Is this this training that they're doing uh, causing this? And it looks like there's a there's a, a definite correlation, and so that's a positive. And the family's really, really, you know, happy that well, not obviously not happy, but they're at least they know that their son and brother didn't just walk in and cold bloodly murder people for no reason. Do you do social media yourself, or do you any promotions, or a website, or? Let's talk about where people find you and the book. I do have a Facebook page, my name. The book is July 30th. It's available, of course, on Amazon or anywhere. Uh, Wild Blue Press and... Oh, of course, yeah. And we'll put all that up on the white website so people can find it. And we appreciate you being here. Now, the book, of course, we're talking about is The Lewiston Shootings. And it's an all-American tragedy. Robert Conlon, thank you for being here. Thank you, gentlemen. I appreciate it. Take care. Thank you. This has been a production of the House of Mystery Radio Show. To find out more about our show, guests, or hosts, go to our website at houseofmysteryradio.com.